Daniel. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Nina Stack, President of the Council of New Jersey Grantmakers, and I am so pleased to welcome you to this webinar that we are uh, funder briefing on the report that has come out from the Anti-Poverty Network of New Jersey, The Uncomfortable Truth, Racism, Injustice, and Poverty in New Jersey, A Call to Action. I think it was a year ago that the Executive Director uh, of the Anti-Poverty Network, Renee, and I met over breakfast and she was telling me about the work that they were doing and I knew that it was something that we wanted to be sure to brief our members on, particularly because of the work that we're doing on race, racism, and the ramifications for philanthropy. And to have something like this that speaks directly to New Jersey is so incredibly valuable for us. Um, so I am I'm very grateful to Renee and the uh, others who I'll be introducing in a minute who are joining us for this webinar. A little bit of uh, logistics to let folks know. Um, first and foremost, uh, Craig Weinrich is uh, the master technologically, and if uh, we find that there is background noise uh, that is disruptive, we will mute you, mute you um, and he can do that remotely, but you can also do that by pressing star seven uh, to mute your line. Um, star six. Ask, I'm sorry? Star six. I'm sorry, star six. Star, star seven, seven, unmute. Yes, star seven is what you use to unmute. So, um, uh, and, but we'll be watching that. And when we get to the Q&A, if for some reason we're not hearing you, chances are you're muted. So you would need to unmute by pressing star seven. Um, we have, through the uh, webinar, we have built in some time for Q&A after specific sections of what's being presented. So know that uh, we will pause before we move on to the, the next portion. Um, throughout, though, however, you are encouraged and welcomed to submit questions. If you look at the lower left-hand corner of your screen, um, there is something that says raise hand, and you can click there and to um, chat with the presenter. And, um, and type in a question or a comment um, at that point. Uh, but as I said, we also will have a time for Q&A. Um, I mentioned about the muting. It's one, because we are making this as interactive as we can, we aren't muting all lines. Um, uh, so we really want to ask you to be conscious of that. Um, so now I'm going to turn, turn things over. We, we're so grateful for the marvelous presenters that we have today to take us through the, um, the process that they used in this report, the findings, um, the importance of it for what we're doing, the data and policy recommendations um, that have come forth through this report. So Renee, uh, is the um, executive director, as I said, of the Anti-Poverty Network of New Jersey. She previously served as the statewide advocacy coordination, coordinator of the National Association of Social Workers for the New Jersey chapter and was the assistant state campaign director for the Citizens Campaign, a New Jersey nonpartisan movement of hundreds of citizens dedicated to innovative government reform and promoting citizen leadership. Um, she comes to us with just fantastic uh, experience and uh, such a wonderfully generous spirit, and we are really grateful for all of that. Her full bio and the full bio of all of our presenters is on our website, so I encourage you to look at those. We will also hear from Dr. Natasha James Walden, uh, who has been involved in the anti-poverty fight for over 20 years. She was selected as a fellow for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Congressional Fellowship and was placed in the office of Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton early in her career. As a lawyer, she's engaged in public interest law. She um, had time at the Legal Aid Society in New York and the Central Jersey Legal Services, um, Central Jersey Legal Services in New Brunswick and Perth Amboy. She was given the opportunity to create an anti-poverty program um, at the uh, Jewish Renaissance Foundation, and at the time she developed a family assistance center and community um, 
uh, program there. She's a charter, she was a charter member and served on the board of the Anti-Poverty Network of New Jersey, and she is also co-chair of uh, the Structural Racism and Poverty Working Group, which is uh, what this report grew out of. Um, Reverend Bruce Davidson is a retired pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church for America. In. In America, sorry. He has served as a pastor of Lutheran congregations in Wildwood, Teaneck, and Summit, New Jersey. He was part of the bishop's staff from 2000 until his retirement in 2011, serving as director of the Lutheran Office of Governmental Ministry in New Jersey, among many other things. He is also um, a board member of one of our members, the New Jersey Foundation for Aging, and, many, and is involved with many other organizations. Um, he also serves as a co-chair of the APN task force group that, that produced the report on racism and poverty. And our great friend and colleague, Brandon McCoy, is also joining us. He's a policy analyst who works on economic economic issues of economic security and the ways in which state and local economic and labor policies affect workers, families, and businesses with New Jersey policy perspective. Um, we, we've had the great pleasure to be working with him from his days uh, before joining NJPP when he was uh, a fellow with the State Priorities Partnership and also a program associate with the Fund for New Jersey, where he assisted in grant making on public policy issues that particularly affected low income and minority populations. Um, we love any opportunity to get to work with Brandon, and we're really so thrilled um, that you could join us today. As I said, the, um, there are more detailed bios on our website, which you received in the email link uh, today, along with a link to the full report if you haven't seen that yet. Um, so I encourage you all to look at that. And now it's my great pleasure to turn things over to Renee. Thank you, Nina, and thank you, Craig, and everyone at the Council of New Jersey Grantmakers for having us today um, and letting us speak about um, this groundbreaking report um, that addresses issues that are critical to our state's future. Um, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about APN in case folks aren't familiar with the Anti-Poverty Network of New Jersey. Um, as you might guess, we are anti-poverty. Um, our mission um, really is to prevent, reduce, and end poverty in New Jersey, uh, a pretty simple statement, but also pretty ambitious. Um, and we've been working at it um, since 1999 when Bruce Davidson was one of the co-founders of APN. Um, and we're a membership organization. Um, we have, uh, as you can see probably on the screen, um, many diverse types of, of members um, individuals, organizations, um, communities of faith, advocates, direct service providers, government partners, labor unions, and anyone else with a passion for social and economic justice. Next. So we empower partners, educate the community, and advocate for solutions together. Um, we have regular meetings every two months um, throughout the year um, where we have great speakers come in to share information about uh, new reports, new information that's pertinent to solving issues of poverty, um, events that are going on around our state, networking, and devising solutions together. Um, we also have the annual Poverty Summit for New Jersey that energizes and educates our partners, our members. Um, we usually have about 250 people attend, and our next one is at the end of this month on October 27th at Rutgers in, in New Brunswick. Um, we do communications work to educate um, the public about issues of poverty and kind of break through some of the myths around poverty, research or reports like the one we're discussing today and also last year with Thomas Edison State College's John Watson Public Policy Institute, we released a report called The Cost of Poverty um, that really detailed how we've pushed poverty into all of our urban areas, big and small across the state. Uh, and that also is on our website if you're interested in looking at that. We also join with other organizations, our members and partners to advocate um, around things like the development of the state rental assistance program here in New Jersey, which we never had any vouchers at the state level until that point. We only had the HUD vouchers for the federal level. Um, our theory of social change is poverty is a complex social problem and it requires complex or comprehensive solutions involving 
all members of society. Next. As you can see from this chart um, from Washington University, um, poverty touches many people. Um, you know, by age 60, about 79% of Americans have experienced some economic hardship, um, and 54% have lived below or near the poverty line um, by age 60 as well. Um, but we wanted to focus in on the issues of structural racism and poverty on this report. Um, the Uncomfortable Truth, Racism, and Justice in Poverty in New Jersey. It's, um, we know that many more people of color are forced into poverty and, and really don't have opportunities available to them that others do. Um, and this report is the collaboration of many wonderful people across our state, including policy experts and advocates who care deeply and deliberated thoughtfully about what the report should be. Um, APN has worked on um, three main areas of poverty throughout our history since 1999, housing, hunger, and economic empowerment. Um, with an increased focus on the racial inequities that create poverty within the organization, in July 2016, the APN Board of Trustees voted to make structural racism an explicit priority for the organization, adding it as our fourth pillar. The many people who helped in the drafting of this report, including the, the wonderful folks on the phone today, did not always agree with every one of the findings and recommendations, but we all recognize that structural racism exists in our state, that it is a leading cause of poverty, and the need to work together for change in New Jersey. Next. So first I just wanted to start off with um, the definition of structural racism that was developed by the steering committee for the report and that guided us in our work. Um, as you can see, it's not prejudice or overt um, expressions of racism. We're not blaming individuals. Um, it's not intentional preferential treatment of one group over another. It refers to disparate access to opportunity that's embedded in the social structures in our state and the result of historical conscious and unintentional policies, decisions, and programs. Um, it's deeply embedded in today's culture and institutions and operates as a perpetual force and a resistance to change in the historic distribution of wealth. Um, more importantly, structural racism can be found in the results that it produces. It is part of our everyday lives and our systems, and we don't necessarily recognize it as such unless we stop to think about the ways that structural ra racism is manifested um, like the group that the steering committee that worked on this report did. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Natasha James Walden. Good afternoon, everyone. This project really um, was a labor of love, and it took quite a while, much longer than what we actually thought. But I wanted to take you through sort of the timeline and how it developed and how we got to where we are today. So we really began probably in about October or between the period of October and December of 2014. The board of APN started to have discussions around um, poverty and racism and sort of what the connections were and started to really reflect on what was going to be the role of APN in addressing that connection. And from that we decided that we wanted to have at least an, a meeting call a meeting together to see if other people throughout the state were actually interested in having discussions on these issues. So the first thing we did is we sort of sent out a letter. Um, the executive director at the time, who was Serena Rice, sent a letter to a lot of people that we had partnered with throughout the state, a lot of different organizations that were working on race issues specifically, and asked them to sort of come to the table. So that call went out in about February 12th of 2015. And we set our first meeting for March 24th, and on that date, we had about 30 people that showed up and expressed an interest in looking into this issue. Now, at that time, um, I don't think that we were very clear as to where we were going or what we were going to do, but we did decide that we wanted to make this a six-month commitment for everybody, if everyone could commit to six months. Well, you can see we're actually two and a half years later, so the six-month commitment really did not stick, but for a lot of different reasons, which I'll take you through. 
But also at that first meeting, what we realized is that we all had different understandings of what racism really was, what structural racism really was, and we all came into the room with sort of our own filters and our own feelings and um, sort of how we felt, and we needed to deal with some of those issues about our own past experiences, whether they were personal, things we observed, things we participated in. So we had a meeting on the 27th. Our next meeting was to bring in a group called Beyond Diversity and to do a training and to help us sort of walk through understanding what our own sort of connections were and understandings were about racism and how it has sort of impacted our lives and how it could potentially impact how we go forward. And the one thing that we really wanted is we wanted to come up with some sort of operation structure in which we could all operate in a safe place, but we could also be extremely honest with each other and really express to each other, you know, our thoughts and feelings without worrying about offending people or hurting people's feelings or not being heard. So from that meeting, we actually came up with a pretty good operation structure and a better understanding of each other and what some of our, experience, our personal experiences were in and around racial issues. And so we held our um, next meeting. And at our next meeting, um, we decided that what we really needed to do is we needed to break down further into working groups that there were really specific areas that we wanted to touch upon as opposed to making this sort of one big comprehensive report. And we also thought it was a way to tie in more people when you actually have the different areas that um, we'll actually break down and discuss a little later on. But it was able to bring more people to the table to actually be able to address very specific areas and how those specific areas were impacted by structural racism. And then during the summer of that year, we actually got a really, um, we actually were really blessed, I guess, to have an intern come in who was able to help coordinate a project that we thought was very important, and that was to actually have working groups where we went into the community, we went into community centers, we went into churches, and we were able to actually talk to people about what their experiences were. If you read through the report, what you'll see is that there are various quotes throughout the report from people that participated in those listening sessions during that summer, people that shared their experiences and, you know, provided us with insight into, you know, areas that maybe we didn't think about or things that, you know, maybe we didn't touch upon because the lived experience is a very important part of not just this report, but very important part of dealing with all issues of poverty and especially is very important for the Anti-Poverty Network. So we're into our um, groups. We've had our summer listening sessions. And so then it became a period of time between August and June of really just working in the groups and sort of what that meant. Um, it was very challenging at different points. I mean, we've had people along the way who have fallen off. We've had new people that have come to the table. Uh, at one point, our group started off maybe, you know, a certain section, a subsection started off maybe with six people, ended up with only one, um, and then we had to build it back up. So I think when you start off with this six-month commitment and it sort of expanded out, um, you know, we had some challenges in terms of you know, people staying involved and people staying engaged. But we were able to um, probably maybe somewhere around the middle of last year, we were able to get a really good, strong core group that kept together and sort of kept on task and kept us moving forward um, with being able to get our sections done. And so then what we realized is that we had all of these six different sections, and they were all written by different authors, and they were all very different. And so how are we going to make this into a comprehensive report in which people would be able to understand, they would be able to follow, and it would seem like it was one cohesive report as opposed to six different random sections. So we were very fortunate to bring in an editor who actually uh, worked with each of the working groups and their chapters to help develop something that you know, could sort of flow together, could sort of connect together. And from that, we produced the final report, which was released on September the 19th, 2017. And now I will turn it over. I think now is the time for questions, actually. Exactly, yes. We wanted to see if any folks had any questions at this stage. I did have one. Okay. Um, which was, you know, it, I commend you, and I know when you've got something that, that evolves like this, how it can it can take off and it takes more time and um, you might feel like how long is this, how long can a string be? But um, 
the, the, the work to define structural racism for your report, what, what did you, what was the definition, did you have a working definition that you could share um, of how you approached it that way? Renee, are you going to take that one? Um, does then someone else want to take that? Well, I know for us, I mean, it really, I think the definition really came out of um, the work that we did with Beyond Diversity and really trying to understand what racism means and how you actually define it. And we really spent a long time in that meeting sort of writing it all out. You know, what are your thoughts? What are those thoughts? You know, what are, you know, everyone sort of gave their thoughts. And we sort of were able at that point, I think, to narrow it down into something that, you know, was basically what Renee actually went over when she sort of laid out what structural racism is and what it is not. Because when we developed the, the definition, the one thing we wanted to be clear upon is, you know, there are certain, when people think of racism, they think of it in a certain way. And so they think, you know, of course, that it's prejudice or that it's something overt or whatever. And that's not what we're talking about at all. We're really trying to get to the heart of the rules and the laws and the things that are in place that um, have historically made it very difficult for people of color as well as for poor people to sort of move beyond their circumstances to a better place. And so that's, it, was, it was really an evolution of what it wasn't, what it is, and sort of melting it all together to come up with that definition. That's helpful. Maybe I, maybe I could add that we had uh, a lot of discussion over the course of our two and a half years about um, whether or not we needed to uh, be very specific and name personal racism and the role that it plays uh, in, in forming structural racism. And um, we don't want to downplay the reality that, especially now, we're aware that there is such a thing um, as, as a, a very strong white supremacy movement in the country uh, that is uh, more vocal than it has been for a while. Um, so there is uh, obviously overt racism um, that has been lurking under the uh, uh, surface for a while and, and becoming certainly more, more um, evident and relevant now. Um, but we also want, uh, wanted to stick to the um, reality that we live with that we are in a society in which uh, some of us, uh, particularly white people, uh, live with certain advantages which are often hidden from us uh, but are a part of the system. And the report um, really weaves through the, uh, the, the whole process of how this has developed uh, from our personal prejudices um, to um, uh, some of the motivations of people in, uh, in society and in politics um, that play on people's fears and, and anxieties um, related to what we have learned about people of different races. Um, and, and so I think we have tried in this to, um, to recognize that structural racism is not something that any one of us created, but it's been with us for a long time. It's part of our life and our history, and we need to talk about it and show how it, um, how it damages not just um, one segment of our, of our society, but our entire society. Um, structural racism uh, costs not just black people and Latino people and, and immigrants, it costs the whole society uh, in terms of, of uh, not just financial um, cost, but, but morality and, and the way we live with one another. Thank you. Other questions? Well, then let's go ahead, um, Bruce, if you would, and start to uh, introduce us to the report recommended, well, the, more than introduce, but dive into uh, the report recommendations and, uh, and importance. Maybe first. Next is Brandon, actually. Brandon, right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, next is Brandon. I apologize. Um, I'm the report data and the findings. Yes, sorry. No, no worries. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, and thank everybody for uh, tuning in this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to kind of quickly go over uh, the data that we used to come to a lot of these con uh, conclusions and also just findings. Uh, but spend, I'm going to spend more time talking about the findings and what 
you know, kind of what they mean for New Jersey. Uh, but just very quickly, you know, the, the, the sources of data at the end of the report, uh, there's a lot of them. There's, there's pages upon pages. So these are just some examples of the type of data that we use. Um, I didn't. I couldn't go through the whole thing because it truly is a whole lot. But just just to give you an idea. Um, a lot of the data sets and reports that were used. You know, obviously the federal data that's available, like the U.S. Census Bureau, um, also reports from a bunch of federal departments, like the Department of Health and Human Service, uh, Human Services, uh, the Department of Justice, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, places like that, um, which have been really, especially under. Uh, the previous administration were producing a lot of really quality reports that were very edifying and clear on uh, on a lot of these topics. So that was a, a major data source. Um, also, the Alice report, which is produced by the United Way of Northern New Jersey, which does a lot of breakdowns on what are the actual economics of living in the state of New Jersey and just how many people are actually struggling to get by. Um, the way that the federal government defines poverty is actually it's not, not particularly entirely helpful here in New Jersey. The poverty level here, um, the, the income that you make in order to qualify for the poverty level in New Jersey is higher than it would be just looking at the federal poverty level. It's more like 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, so the Alice Report actually incorporates that lens in looking at how people are getting by in New Jersey and, or how they're not getting by. Um, there's also the Poverty Benchmarks Report from um, the Poverty Research Institute of Legal Services of New Jersey, which also does some similar things to the Alice report. Um, there's a lot of overlap between them, but a little bit of um, some, some differences in how they look at the data, looking at you know household income, um, food security, uh, just things like that. Um, a lot of reports from New Jersey policy perspective, very easy for me to access as I work there, but I'm always trying to incorporate um, a lot of things where we're looking at you know what are the tax and budget implications and also the tax and budget reasons for a lot of the conditions that currently exist in New Jersey and a lot of the, the conditions around poverty and racism, and a lot that was helpful. And then the Regional Plan Association also had a lot of good reports on housing and land use and how, how the state is you know, so segregated uh, while, we, while we remain very dense. Um, that, and that's always very interesting to look at because it's kind of an oxymoron to be so dense and have so many people almost literally living on top of each other, but still have so much segregation going on. The Regional Planet Association had a lot of things looking into the different ways that that manifests itself throughout, throughout our state. Um, we also used a lot of excerpts from different books on this topic, again, more than just what's here, but some of the ones that are more popular that stand out, there was The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, uh, which has been out uh, for a couple of years now, uh, produced in 2010, looking at the criminal justice system. Um, in a lot of the ways that uh, black and brown people are arrested at higher rates, even though uh, the behavior is not any different than that of, of white counterparts. Uh, the Color of Law, which is a book that actually just came out this year, which is really, really good, um, looks at specific government policies um, that created segregation throughout the country, uh, things like redlining, um, different programs that were available to veterans when they came back, and programs that were not available to uh, veterans of color when it came back. Uh, so basically, you know, kind of segregation and racism that was written into law and accepted. Um, Detached America, um, which came out last year, a really good book, also about the suburbs. And, you know, obviously in New Jersey, we have a lot of small and suburbs outside of our cities um, and all, all the history that associated with that. And then Evicted by Matthew Desmond, which came out last year also, which is a really I mean, incredible look at um, kind of the rental crisis and the eviction crisis in the country. Um, and, how, you know, there's some stats in there relating to New Jersey, too, actually, um, and some of the sources that he cites. Um, but I, that's a book I suggest to everybody read if you have not. It is an incredible look at just how precarious it is for a lot of people in this country to rent their housing and just how one small mistake or something really unintentional uh, can uh, kick them out of that housing or give, give a lot of deference to the owner of the home, uh, the, you know, the renter or the rentee, I guess. Um, and just a, a lot of the, a lot, look at a lot of the legal um, structures around that and how easy it is for somebody to lose a home and be kind of, you know, house insecure. And uh, I think so as somebody who used to work on housing a lot, 
I think everything comes back to the home. If you don't have a secure home to go back to at the end of the day, it is very hard to be consistent or build success in other areas of your life. And that's a really good book on that topic. Uh, next slide, Craig, please. Thank you. Um, and then also the, in, in the appendices, just some more um, primary documents that were provided straight, straight in the report itself. There's, a, there's an ad, a letter from the public advocate on the fair housing decision in Westchester County versus the United States. Um, and that kind of talks about different, you know, consolidated plan submissions um, and relates to a lot of segregation issues. So that's, that's a good um, example of kind of what happens in a lot of these cases. And uh, not, not the most exciting read for certain people, but for everybody, uh, people on this call, it actually is kind of interesting to see how this type of stuff plays out and what are the processes of, um, you know, when we're talking about racism and uh, discrimination realized in government policy, how does that play out? And this is a part of that. Uh, also, we have some data tables on population by different uh, races and ethnicities, uh, looking at different university counties and municipalities. Um, and then there's also a list of social determinants of health. Um, and those are all you know, pretty good examples of what we were looking at as primary documents. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a few examples of data and graphs we used. Um, as somebody who writes policy briefs as my job, uh, people more often don't like to read. So providing visual assistance and you know, uh, visual, uh, being able to get across your point in a kind of very impactful, short and sweet visual medium is really important. So here's a really good visual graphic on you know the um, the likelihood of an of an individual depending on their ethnicity or race to be imprisoned, um, and that was people who were born in 2001. So we can see here, you know, white women are the least likely, and black men are the most likely. And that's a quick a quick visual that's pretty easy to use. Uh, next slide, please, Craig. Uh, here's another one. So looking at the increase in the state and federal prison population over the years. Um, you know, clearly the United States is, has the most, um, the highest share of its population in prison, um, but this is something that really gets that point across quickly. Um, next, next slide, Craig. Thank you. Uh, there's a portion of the report that looks at um, licenses and also um, licenses for uh, undoc undocumented immigrants or um, other forms of identification and what what's the correlation between drivers with licenses and drivers, drivers without licenses uh, in regards to fatal accidents that occur. So we, you know, a big argument for providing licenses to undocumented immigrants is that it gives them more confidence uh, to drive safely and not be so worried about, you know, um, getting, getting, having engagement with law enforcement or something that could threaten uh, their, their, their ability to live where they are. Uh, so this is a graph from NJPP that actually looks at different states and the country as a whole in regards to uh, that issue. Uh, next slide, Craig. Thank you. Uh, here's the last graph. So uh, this is actually a table looking at voter participation by race and ethnicity. Uh, it, I think this, I believe this is in New Jersey. Yes. Um, and again, you know, just I just wanted to kind of very quickly show the different ways that we use graphs and tables and stuff to present data. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it, um, and we try to take full advantage of it uh, when we could. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. So the findings that we had, uh, these are the five overarching findings of the report. Again, it's a very long report, and in each chapter, there are six different chapters. There are specific recommendations uh, and findings for like each of those policy areas. So for instance, uh, you know, legal protections or criminal justice or housing or health, like those are all specific areas. So this is just the general overarching findings for the whole report. You know, the first one being about how historical forces and policy decisions at various levels of government have really shaped the on-the-ground realities of poverty in the state. Um, and I think, you know, this gets to the funding decisions, budget choices, that elected officials in New Jersey have made. Uh, and over the past 20, 25 years, those have been decisions that have really imperiled important and effective programs, right? Um, so as we continue to do things that increase the state's level of debt, 
um, as we continue to pull back funding from important services and important assets um, and funnel those things, those, those resources away from those important things and into you know, tax cuts for corporations or wealthy residents, uh, that has a real tangible impact uh, and has a tangible impact on how we pursue policies that help reduce poverty. So whether it's actually funding schools properly, whether it's actually funding health care programs properly, uh, funding services that have to deal with food and hunger security, uh, helping to uh, produce affordable housing, any of those things, that does require government participation. Um, and over the past 25 years, there's been a lot of decisions, uh, really reckless, uh, you know, I would say reckless decisions that are not really conservative from a budgetary perspective. They're not conservative in making sure that the state can continue to afford its responsibilities or support its assets. And as a result, we can we see an increase in income inequality because the state is not doing its part uh, to help fight poverty. Um, one of the second findings, uh, the second finding rather, was that you know structure, uh, structural sources of persistent poverty. Uh, kind of really shows the different limitations on access to opportunity. And now, as a result, we have two different and unequal economic ladders. So, again, these, these decisions have created conditions that are now, you know, further exas exasperating um, the situation of poverty in different parts of our state. And as an individual who is having a tough time getting by already, um, having important programs that are meant to pull you out of poverty, having those programs not receive the support or the funding uh, that they need or, you know, not have the capacity and staffing uh, in order to deliver that service in a way that's efficient and effective for you, you know, that's, that's hurting you as somebody who's already struggling. Uh, so the state has made decisions that have made it hard to make sure to, to, to reach the people that really need the most help, basically. Um, Number three is that you know, New Jersey is not unique in facing these issues, but there are characteristics that are particular to New Jersey. Uh, home rule, uh, which is basically the ability for municipalities to have almost complete control over their land use decisions. Uh, New Jersey is not the only state with that, but we, we certainly, you know, we, we certainly take full advantage of that. Uh, having so many towns, 565 towns, in this in this state, in such a small state, it becomes incredibly difficult to make policy decisions that affect a region when you have to have everybody buy in, and there's no larger force at a county level or something like that to say, okay, everybody in this county is going to do this thing. Um, so there's a unique history, history there's a unique history and uh, you know a new culture here in New Jersey that manifests racial inequity and segregation in a different way here. Uh, than other places. Again, the state is incredibly dense, but it's incredibly segregated. Um, you know, I actually I went to the, the Blousing School for a graduate degree, and there was a shirt that we used to have in school that said, uh, home rule is the only rule. Because at the end of the day, um, if you can't figure out a way to work around home rule, uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble trying to implement your policy or your, or your regional plan. Uh, fourth is that despite the segregation, you know, persistent poverty in New Jersey hurts everyone. And Bruce kind of spoke to this earlier in that something that when we're looking at policy decisions, policy proposals, a lot of times we break it down by different groups, right? Like, so say something like minimum wage. Well, how many minimum wage workers are women? How many minimum wage workers are people of color? And it's very, very important to recognize what those disparities are because if we don't recognize those disparities, then we can't try to fix them. But at the same time, uh, it's important when communicating those disparities to communicate in a way of saying these, you know, to whoever your audience is, to whoever you're, the person you're trying to reach is, is to say these are your fellow New Jerseyans. And even though this is not something that may not, you know, this may not affect you personally, these are people who are, friends and family and neighbors and colleagues and part of the shared community of our state. And anytime somebody in our state is hurting, that is going to affect everybody else, even if you don't see it, even if you don't see it in your day-to-day -day or if it's not, you know, smack dab hitting you in the face in the morning, um, it's going to affect you when it comes to your pocketbook, uh, how many taxes you pay, the, um, how, you know, how much 
need there is to for the state to do more to alleviate poverty. And there's a lot of talk these days about us versus them, and that does a whole lot more harm because it's not engendering a conversation around uh, we are all in this together. Um, and even though something may not be an issue for me in particular, it is an issue for somebody in my community. And if they are having a problem with that or they have, if they're having trouble with that, then I need to recognize that and figure out how to help them with that because as long as they're having trouble with that, they are not living their fullest life. They are not having the, they don't have the ability to do the things that they want to do to contribute to my community or my, my county or my state, whatever it is, right? So even though there's a lot of separation, um, the fact is that poverty helps even the wealthy among us um, because it's, cause now the state is, is being limited in its, in its capacity and its ability to do more. Um, and even if it's a small number, again, there's a small number of people that are struggling, that's, that's a problem, but this is a large number of people that are struggling. Um, a third of New Jersey workers make poverty wages. They work full-time and they make poverty wages. And that's, so that's a problem for everybody. That's a problem for our economy. Um, and that's something that everybody needs to be aware of in talking about these issues. Um, and then fifth, just the, you know, the entrenched, there's, there's patterns of disempowerment and they can only be overcome through recognizing kind of our shared uh, community, the, the importance of our shared community, but also work in recognizing the importance of working together um, to overcome issues that are larger than us. Uh, so Reverend Dr. William Barber, who is the leader of the Moral Mondays Movement in North Carolina, he was formerly the uh, head of the NAACP in North Carolina, he talks about the morality of policy decisions. Um, and I think, you know, somebody spoke to this, out of Bruce and Natasha spoke to this earlier about, you know, the racism of policy decisions. And we're kind of at a tenuous point here because there's been so much over racism and so much, you know, um, public activity on the part of white supremacists and, um, and groups like that that racism is, racism is kind of becoming this thing that unless you're wearing a hood, well, you're not a racist. And you have politicians who were very clear in denouncing the racism and the hatred of the activity and the actions in Charlottesville, but then the next day went back to work trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act and not seeing, you know, kind of the similarities between those two things. Yes, it is very terrible for people to be marching in the streets talking about white supremacy, but it's also terrible to be p pushing policies that, in effect, are racist, that do more harm for communities of color and for the poor. Um, so when we, I think, you know, in the description of racism that we, the structural racism that we rolled out before, the, the second bullet point says it's not talking about intentional or that it is not intentional racism or intentional targeting of groups. And some people kind of come short at that one. They say, what do you mean it's not intentional? I think what we mean by that is that it's not only intentional. The issue here is not intentional racism. The issue here is not people who wake up in the morning and say, I'm really going to try to mess with the lives of this particular group of people. It is effectual racism. And people who, even if they don't mean to, even if they're not setting out to do it, even if it's not like on their to-do list for the day, their actions are still resulting in having racism and poverty uh, be a major factor in the community or in the state or in the country. Um, so in, in sense, while we, we definitely want to limit the um, power and ability of people who are going to be intentionally racist, this is about expanding the conversation to those people who are not intentionally racist but are still enabling uh, racism through policy, uh, through behavior, uh, through action, and making sure that we're not losing our, you know, uh, our perspective here uh, that a lot of the policies currently in place help engender racism and help engender poverty in New Jersey. And if somebody signed on to that or somebody was a sponsor on that legislation, it doesn't matter that they didn't mean to do it. It matters that we recognize what the impact has been, the effect has been, and have an honest conversation about how to remedy that. Um, and that's, that's, that's basically, I think, what we're trying to get at with this report. Uh, does, any, does anybody have any questions?
So, uh, Brandon, it's Nina. I do. Um, thank you. Uh, and, and that's part of what we're trying to do with the work that we're doing is to help people understand you know, just how insidious and unexpected and w what the ramifications are and, and what it means. I, I was struck, you know, I'm, I, uh, the home rule, your, your se sentence from Blaustein that it's, you've always got to run it through that and know that it, that's going to drive so much of what happens. But you mentioned that there are other characteristics that are particular to New Jersey. And there's so much phenomenal um, data that you've compiled here. And I'm wondering if there are any others that come to mind of those sort of characteristics or data points where New Jersey might be um, – that New Jersey is somehow different or that it might even be a bright spot in the data compared to other places, um, something that could be leveraged? <laughs> well, I think something that could be leveraged here is our share of immigrant population. Uh, other than, I believe, California and New York, we have the largest share of our population that is from another country. Um, and, you know, I, I, obviously there are certain people who don't, value that or don't think that's a strength, but uh, I, I think it is a strength and it is something to always be proud of and tout and try to support. Um, for to, to be a, a state as small as we are and still have so many immigrants and people who want to come to this country and then when they come to this country want to be here, I think it's a badge of honor and a badge of pride. Um, and there's so many parts of, excuse me, of New Jersey uh, where that population is the largest in the world outside of its uh, outside of its home, right? Uh, I, I remember somebody saying of the South Asian population, the Indi Indians, Indian Americans uh, outside of India, like the largest uh, concentration of Indians is in like Middlesex County, <laughs> and, or you know, in Edison. Is it New like Jersey? Mm-hmm. Um, people saying that you know when you go to Edison. Um, and I guess I guess it'll probably be North Brunswick, East Brunswick. Um, it's just you know such a strong culture there, and as something to be proud of, and that you can go around the state and actually experience you know parts of different cultures, and you can't say that about everywhere. There's a lot of states where you can't say that at all, um, but we have that here. We have something different to offer, no matter where you go in the state, and I think that's something that's really awesome, and we don't really talk it up enough. Um, and we actually, I think, we let people who are negative about it talk about it more than people who are positive about it. Um, and then I guess the other unique characteristic is just that um, the level of segregation here is really high. Um, I can't remember the statistic off the top of my head right now, but the segregation in our school system is incredible. Um, and even in schools that, if you look at the whole student body, are really diverse. Uh, when you see how students are interacting throughout the day, in the school itself, they're pretty segregated too. Um, so figuring out a way to discuss that issue, um, and even though we have diverse communities, the schools themselves are not as diverse because people who live in places that are, have more of a population of people of color uh, are sending their kids to other places to go to school or sending their kids to private school or things like that uh, rather than sending their kids to a more diverse school system. Um, so we have a very, I think it's, I think it's worse than it was pre-Brown versus Board of Ed or at that same level of segregation right now. And what does that mean, you know, for the future, uh, for the future population of the state? And this is Renee, if I could just add to that. Um, yes, we have, um, uh, we're the third most segregated state in the nation in terms of housing and certainly segregated schools as a result of that. Um, but as, as in terms of your question, Nina, uh, a couple of positives are that we also have the School Funding Reform Act that was adopted here in the state. And we finally, in this recent budget, state budget, got some more money um, for that when it's been really underfunded. Um, and so um, we have, um, you know, mechanisms in place to make sure that um, kids are getting what they need in schools if we can work on desegregating housing um, and, and schools in our state. And the other thing in terms of housing is we have the Mount Laurel decisions here in New Jersey, and we've had recent court decisions over the last couple of years 
that have helped sway um, the movement and conversation back to um, municipalities providing their fair share of affordable homes. The, the critical piece there will be over the next 10 years as those affordable homes are being supplied and built is to make sure that we have people in our communities who care enough to make sure that the people who've been denied housing over the de decades um, actually get access to those affordable homes when they are built. I'll just, say, I'll, just, I'll just add one thing to that, too, about, you know, us having laws and legislation in place that is positive. So, for instance, this past budget fight, this, the past budget that was passed in um, this last, in, what was it, July, June, July, um, you know, the Democratic Party had held out for, uh, they had made a deal with the governor in order to get fund $300 million in funding for various programs. Um, and those programs were included in the budget. Uh, the fact remains that uh, revenue was not raised to actually pay for those programs. So while we fight for these programs and these policies that we want, passing them and implementing them into law is only half the battle because if we're not supporting them with the necessary funding for them to be effective and successful and helpful, then we've really, we really haven't won very much because then people are going to say, oh, see, so you passed this law, you know, you passed funding for schools, but then you didn't follow it up with the actual money. Or, and see, now it's, not, now it's not working, so you can and you do this all the time. So a lot of times we divorce fighting for certain policies from what it takes to make sure those policies are successful. And we need to make sure that people are connecting those two ends of the spectrum um, because just getting those policies in place is not enough. Supporting those policies year in, year out is what is necessary. Okay, and, right. and maybe could I just add, and I don't want to take this too far, but um, I think a strength in New Jersey, um, and, and I've been part of a national network on advocacy, is we have a pretty strong advocacy community uh, that has been active and effective, uh, including the Anti-Poverty Network, but a lot of other organizations that have um, really influenced public policy in the state. Um, our legislature has um, at times been um, pretty open to some of the things that have been uh, suggested and pushed by, by those of us who have been advocates. Uh, not always, um, but I think the legislature has at least some uh, people in both parties who are willing to uh, listen and, and act on um, changing policies that, that really do benefit people living in poverty. Uh, and I've seen that a number of times. But I think right now, and I raise this uh, for a specific reason, right now advocacy is going to be extremely important. Um, as you read through the report, which I hope you'll do, um, it's pretty uh, scary to think about how much we have to change and turn back um, that we have lived with for so long. Um, but it is possible because if, if we can motivate the voices of, of people living in the community along with organizations that have a long history of being able uh, to lift up concerns in a, in a compelling way, um, we have the potential for bringing change. Um, and I think that's something that New Jersey has that not every state does have. Um, we, we can, I believe, um, begin to bring about some of the, uh, the needed changes that are, that are uh, outlined in the report. And some of the recommendations that sound maybe uh, at first glance a little bit um, pie in the sky um, can actually uh, be implemented. Um, and that there is some support both in the community and in the legislature for making a change. As, as Brandon said very well, we have to not just make the changes, we have to make sure that the changes actually do something. But we have organizations like the, um, the Fair Housing uh, in uh, South Jersey that have just dogged at the uh, Mount Laurel uh, decision for years to make sure that those um, recommendations that were passed by the Supreme Court were actually implemented despite enormous um, resistance to those changes. And, and they have prevailed. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's a hopeful sign for us. We have a strong advocacy community, and that community can and does work together 
um, pretty effectively. So, Bruce, we're going to um, going to turn it over to you to start talking about some of those policy recommendations. But while you've said that, I just want to remind our members on the phone that we will, um, for those of you who may not be funders of advocacy or policy issues, may not have a clear understanding of how you can do that, what what you're allowed to do. We are uh, very pleased that we're going to have a workshop specifically on that. How foundations, um, what what the rules are around foundations and funding advocacy work um, at our annual meeting in December. So the pre-meeting workshop this year is focused on that. So I just want to uh, put that um, out there so folks know. And I think uh, with time, so uh, Bruce, if we could turn over to you to take us through the, um, the highlights of the report recommendations, and, and then we'll open sure. it up for Q&A. Thank you. And, uh, so, Craig, I think, you, I think you've got us up to uh, the next slide, um, hopefully, systemic solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Um, so um, the report is long. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting read. Um, it includes a lot of background information. It has a, a fairly effective preface about um, racism and poverty. Um, and a lot of uh, data along with historic um, references to uh, how we got to where we are. Um, the systemic solutions that um, you'll see on the slide, there are uh, five of them there, are, are recommendations, uh, policy recommendations, that um, really kind of come out of our, our work together. Uh, covering um, not everything. Uh, there are actually a, a total of, I believe, um, 40 recommendations in the report uh, if, you add, um, if you add them all up, um, at least that many, um, uh, if you put all of the chapter recommendations in place. But these five are those that we uh, kind of agree are, are policy uh, changes that, that could be put in place uh, that would begin to make a difference uh, in how we address structural racism. We do identify in the report that structural racism is a primary cause of poverty in New Jersey, and it's also a barrier to uh, implementing solutions. Uh, racism and racially skewed policies that weave through our nation and also New Jersey's history require comprehensive responses. Uh, so in addition to policy changes, targeted to specific institutions. Um, there are key changes on the state level that can provide the impetus and tools to change the really entrenched patterns of racial and ethnic disparity that have been documented throughout the report. So here's what we have um, identified. First of all, make addressing structural ra racism an explicit public priority. Um, we think think that the state of New Jersey uh, has to commit itself to an inclusive and concerted, aggressive, and powerful effort to end both racism and poverty. And that includes mounting a well-publicized campaign to educate public officials and the general public about the ways in which racism really harms all of us, uh, economically, environmentally, socially, and morally. Um, a statewide inclusive task force should be created to develop a comprehensive plan to mitigate the barrier effects of racism that perpetuate poverty, and that would include legislative and administrative action and necessary funding support. So making structural racism an explicit public priority in New Jersey is our first recommendation. Um, and again, if you read the report, you can uh, appreciate the, the connection between um, uh, entrenched and ongoing poverty um, and, and the power of racism, which now is, is, is really built into our system. The second recommendation is to enact legislation that requires racial impact statements for all state legislation and rulemaking with potential disparate impacts. Um, so um, we have begun to make a little process, progress in that in New Jersey in sentencing decisions uh, in legislation that was signed this past summer. Um, so we feel, though, in parallel to the requirement for fiscal impact statements that are attached to bills and regulations that have a potential impact in the state budget, 
we think that all state legislation and regulations that may have a disparate impact on communities of low income or communities of color would require and should require an Office of Legislative Services departmental analysis of this potential impact for consideration in the, in the process of deliberation as, as legislatures and, and, and rule, uh, rule makers uh, are at work. Um, as the report, I think, makes clear, data supporting these kinds of things is available, um, and it's not that difficult to get a, uh, a handle on. Uh, so it is possible for uh, these kind of impact statements uh, to be attached to legislation. And, and they should be for the sake of the, of the public so that they know what's, what the impacts may be. But also, um, many of the legislatures just need to have that pointed out to them, and they don't always have that information. Uh, third, um, we would require data collection and dissemination by race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status. Um, all state departments that collect program service data should be required to calculate demographic data, racial, ethnic, and poverty data, and to make this data publicly available with all necessary protections, obviously, for personal data, um, but just to make sure that we are clear about how, um, how decisions really do affect people um, uh, of low income and, and particularly people um, whose who's, um, whose race and ethnicity is, is, uh, is, is influenced by those decisions. Um, fourth, we would like to see uh, that the uh, Public Advocates Office be reinstated um, and, uh, and reestablished, an independent office of public advocate with the power and the resources to audit public agencies. Um, having as a priority mandate the charge to evaluate policies or programs that perpetuate racial and gender disparity. In addition, we think it's important to reactivate the Commission on New Americans uh, that was established, I think, back in, uh, in 2007. Uh, that commission was charged with integrating immigrants um, in, into society to protect their rights, as well as to take steps to alleviate poverty. Um, as the primary recommendation of that Blue Ribbon Panel on Immigrant Policy, the Commission on New Americans was created under the public advocate by executive order in January 2010, met for almost a year without a public advocate. Uh, but without that person in office, uh, it ceased to function. Uh, the power of the public advocate, I think, um, to be able to lift up and, and, and challenge legislators and educate the public is evident in the letter in Appendix A that came from Dr. Chen, who was the last public advocate, um, who really outlined pretty well um, the realities of housing discrimination in New Jersey and, and some ways that we could combat that. And finally, the fifth uh, priority um, recommendation is that we strengthen the state's division of civil rights. Um, we need to facilitate enhanced capacity in, within that division to file and prosecute systemic racism, uh, ca uh, the, the various cases of that, by removing the current restrictions that require an individual plaintiff to demonstrate personal harm. Um, we, we really do feel at this point in time that um, we have some pretty good uh, laws on the books. We have policies that seem to uh, be aimed at addressing racism uh, and addressing poverty, but so often those policies and, and legislation behind them uh, is not enforced or properly implemented. And we think that um, the Division of Civil Rights will need to have uh, a greater capacity to be able to address those issues uh, independently um, based on, on their own observations um, and, and on recommendations that might come from a group um, that, is, that is looking very closely at how structural ra racism affects um, our, our state. Um, next slide, please. So um, as I said, there are um, 40 uh, specific recommendations. We're not going to go through all of them, uh, but we picked out a couple from the different chapters uh, in the report. Um, and I just want to touch on some of those. First of all, in the housing section, 
um, one recommendation is that to the greatest extent possible, uh, the state should implement a carrot and stick approach to eliminating racism. We think there are ways that um, a, such an approach would allocate and distribute uh, an enhanced amount of state funds and resources, school aid, um, road maintenance funding, et cetera, um, and some discretionary federal funds that would um, maybe uh, meaningfully and substantially and measurably promote inclusion and integration. If the community can show that um, to, to help reward them with, with some enhanced funding. Uh, and on the other hand, the, uh, the stick part of that is those communities um, that are not facilitating uh, the providable, for instance, of provision of affordable housing in ways that reduce neighborhood segregation um, should have um, uh, their funding curtailed, we believe. Um, and in the past, um, there have been instances where we actually have rewarded communities um, for, um, for their policies of keeping um, their communities um, free of affordable housing by selling their, quote, obligation to other communities. Uh, we think that that's a kind of thing that we should uh, bring to an end. We're going to move to the next one, if we can, next slide. Um, so children and youth, um, a couple of things in there that we think would be helpful um, in terms of addressing both uh, racism and, and poverty. Um, first of all, we need to provide enhanced resources and support directly to poor families. Uh, poor families often, uh, as the report shows, find themselves in more trouble with child welfare uh, than, other, than other families do. Um, and the stress of living in poverty um, sometimes um, can, be, can, can lead people to believe that um, children are either being ignored or abused when actually there's more to the situation than meets the eye. Um, so um, we would recommend uh, continuing efforts to enhance the services and supports provided to families with child welfare involvement. Uh, for instance, strengthening funding and services for family stabilization. Um, especially housing assistance and flexible subsidies for economic need that would reduce out-of-home placements. Um, if, if families can have a bit more financial stability, both in terms of where they live uh, and their uh, access to affordable nutrition, for instance, um, if that stabilization is in place, um, then, then children are going to be uh, safer um, families are going to be able to be more effective and successful, uh, we believe, um, and there won't be the need then uh, for children to be removed from their home, which is, which is a tremendously traumatic thing, um, and placed in, in other kinds of settings. Um, however, um, when, when removal of a child or children is, is necessary because a family simply can't survive um, safely, um, then we would encourage reducing uh, financial and logistic regulatory barriers to, place ship, uh, to placement in kinship legal guardianship. In other words, um, situations where a family member uh, or, or a, a, a someone with a close relationship with a family takes over custody um, of that child when out-of-home placement is necessary. Um, that kind of, of support uh, in New Jersey could be enhanced and improved beyond what it is now. Uh, and fin finally, uh, strengthening the capacity of the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families Program to provide assistance to the poorest children. Um, in New Jersey, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families um, has not had its funding raised um, for 30 years. Um, it is $424 a month, and that's the maximum. And that amount of money has not been raised in 30 years. Um, it is 25%. If you get that um, as your, your uh, benefit, that's 25% of the federal poverty level, which as uh, was pointed out by Renee earlier, is about half of what it actually costs just to get by in the state of New Jersey. Um, we're encouraging that that be increased at least um, to be 50%, so at least doubled of uh, the federal poverty level. And, and even that is, is, is hardly going to lift people 
um, out of the most severe poverty. Um, but having this continue to be um, so underfunded and so unrealistically funded for so long um, is, is really uh, terrible for people living in poverty. Um, and finally, remove the punitive family cap policy that we have in the state that, that um, limits the number of children, limits your aid to, uh, to the number of children you have, um, so that all extremely poor children have access to cash assistance. Um, so next slide, please. Um, moving on then to health, hunger, and mental health. Um, we have uh, in New Jersey um, a number of things that um, help people who are, are dealing with hunger, um, health, and, and mental health. Uh, we want to focus on one in particular um, related uh, to hunger, and that's the um, a supplemental, uh, supplemental knee, uh, nutrition assistance program, formerly food stamps, SNAP. Um, uh, we want uh, to encourage the state to uh, apply for what are available waivers that would increase eligibility um, for food stamps uh, for SNAP to 200% of the federal poverty level, which again is closer to what uh, is realistic in New Jersey. Um, this would mean that struggling families and senior citizens would be able to access appropriate food assistance. Um, right now, New Jersey is number 39 in the nation in participation in the SNAP program. 77% um, of eligible people in the state of New Jersey receive SNAP benefits versus a national average of 83%. Uh, we think that that can and should be changed. And if the state would apply for the waiver that's available, uh, we could raise the amount of uh, funding that would be um, available to us uh, that and an, and an increased effort to uh, reach out to people um, who are um, uh, eligible for these benefits uh, but may not know it or, or may need help in, in applying for those benefits um, would, would make a huge difference. Um, next slide, please. Uh, economic justice, uh, a huge section in the report, obviously. Um, two recommendations that we would lift up. First of all, um, we, we would support uh, the current efforts to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, the current minimum wage as of this year, 2017, in January, it was raised to $8.44. Um, and uh, that is uh, still not going to put you at the poverty level uh, in the state of New Jersey. Um, and uh, we really think it's way past time uh, for the state of New Jersey to have a minimum wage that will um, not only make it possible for uh, the lowest income people to, to manage their, their household, uh, but would also have a positive effect on all other low wage workers. Whenever the minimum wage goes up, it has a positive impact uh, on, on most low wage uh, earners, um, and we would like to see that happen. The livable wage in New Jersey, just for comparison, um, if you are uh, a family of, of three uh, living in a two-bedroom, renting a two-bedroom apartment in the state of New Jersey, in order to meet your expenses, you would need to earn $26.52 uh, just to be able to do that in this state. So raising the minimum wage um, up to where it's at $15 an hour is at least one step in the right direction. Uh, and finally, again, we, we call for tax justice, real, really true tax reform, where, where those folks that have um, a, a substantial income are paying their fair share. Uh, the report uh, indicates how in the state um, the, the uh, poorest individuals, the people with the lowest income, pay the largest percentage of their income in taxes, and, and the uh, highest percentage uh, uh, of those people living in the state uh, pay the smallest percentage of their income. We think that that structure should be looked at and changed. Uh, the earned income tax credit is a success story, um, both uh, on the federal level and, and in, the New Jersey, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, that gives uh, people a one-time uh, refund 
of, uh, of their tax dollars if they, if they income qualify. Um, and in, in this state, the state's uh, earned income tax credit, EITC, has helped people to pay bills at the end of the year, um, uh, uh, cut down educational costs, um, a variety of things that can be done. That money uh, comes back to households and it is spent um, by low-income families to at least give them a chance to, to lower some of their debt um, and possibly um, purchase things that, that are they're definitely needed. Uh, also, uh, we would like to see the child tax credit expanded. Um, that would uh, benefit, again, families in another way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, criminal justice, um, we have a few things that are, or that are pretty scary in New Jersey. Um, we have uh, a large number of people who are incarcerated uh, in the state. And um, a, as was shown in the previous uh, slide and chart, um, one in six um, black men are going to be uh, incarcerated in their life. Uh, that seems to be uh, a pretty frightening statistic compared to uh, when, particularly when you compare it to other populations. Um, we have a growing prison population, um, and many of, much of that is due to some rather harsh legislation that came out of uh, the, last, the end of the last century. Um, we would like to see um, two things happen. First of all, uh, that we require racial and ethnic impact statements for legislation that's related to criminal justice. So um, the tough on crime legislation that comes out should show how um, those, those um, measures might impact and influence uh, particular races and, and eth ethnic communities in the state. Um, and, and um, you know, hopefully that would slow down or at least um, give us a second thought um, about how we might implement some things. Um, it is a little bit difficult to appreciate that in the state of New Jersey, depending on where you live, um, if you commit a particular, what's considered a particular crime, um, you will go to jail if you live in one community, um, but you won't if you live in another. Um, thing, things that, um, that seem counterproductive or counterintuitive. Um, finally, um, we are saying in the report that it would be helpful um, in terms of addressing uh, criminal justice related to, um, uh, to race is, uh, by legalizing, regulize, regulating, and taxing marijuana, which is a bit of a um, controversial thing to do. Um, but for instance, 13% uh, of New Jersey's population uh, is African American, um, but 64% of the pro um, uh, prison population is African American. Um, and, and many of those uh, folks who are in prison um, are there because of a, um, uh, a crime, um, basically just using marijuana um, and mandatory sentences uh, related to that. Uh, marijuana prohibition, the report says, is costly, unfair, and ineffective. New Jersey arrests more than 22,000 people a year for marijuana possession, and that costs us $125 million. Um, this is a wasteful policy. It criminalizes otherwise law-abiding people and wastes resources that would be better spent on projects that support families and communities. New Jersey's marijuana laws have had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. African Americans are three times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than whites, even though both whites and blacks um, have about the same rate of use of marijuana. Um, anecdotal evidence suggests similar disparities for Lat Latinos. In addition to the severe long-term consequences of a marijuana conviction, marijuana laws have been used to support biased policies like stop and frisk, racial profiling, and the deportation of people of color. Um, a solution would be to legalize tax and regulate marijuana like alcohol is for adults. Um, New Jersey should enact common sense and popular reform. Um, to create a responsible, safe, and controlled system. Um, that's one recommendation, and 
Um, depending on how that strikes you, it might encourage you to read the rest of the report and recommendations. Um, remember, it's one of 40, and not everybody uh, on the committee thinks that's, that's something they can stand behind. Uh, but we think it's, it's one place where we can at least give some attention to this. Next slide, please. Um, under legal and civil protections, um, pretty straightforward. Um, we have seen dramatic cuts, and there are even more dramatic cuts proposed uh, for legal services and free legal services for low-income people. Um, the, um, uh, the ability of people to represent themselves in court um, has been shown to be tremendously ineffective, and, and people um, who have tried to get um, legal representation that they are entitled to by law have either not been able to afford even the, the small processing fees uh, or find a, a, a lawyer who would be willing to represent them. Um, and because of that, people who are uh, otherwise would be um, given probation or, or a lesser offense are finding themselves incarcerated um, because of, of, of their income and, their, and where they are. Um, we would like to see um, more opportunity for people to have legal protections and legal representation available to them, and that means increasing funding for those, uh, those programs. Um, and secondly, um, we think in terms of, of helping at least to address some of the abuses um, that have been reported in the state of New Jersey in terms of, of um, uh, particularly the way uh, police um, in some communities may be targeting folks, um, is to um, institute a local civilian complaint review board um, in every community that would increase oversight and accountability of police departments and officers. And where that is effective and where that's working, it doesn't just protect the citizens, it also protects the police. Um, and it builds a level of trust that in many communities is just absent right now. Um, I think that's the end of my section. Never ask a preacher to be the last speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so now I think we are, Renee, you spend a little bit of time on some next steps and then we'll open it up. I re, I'm conscious of the time and we, we yes. want to try to wrap up by four. Yes, I will try to go through this last slide quickly. <laughs> So um, first thing is to promote the report through the media and APM membership, and we've already begun that. Um, we've already gotten good press coverage through TV and print media um, in NJ Spotlight um, and working with our members through a release event that we did on the 19th of September in Trenton and then also presenting the report at our um, bi-monthly general meeting last Wednesday. Um, we also, um, you know, and this is, the hard work, you know, of the, of the report. Um, it certainly took a long time to get the report done, but um, the, the work ahead is, is equally as difficult, if not more, um, in terms of bringing people together. You know, the intent is to bring people together across color lines and other artificial divides, um, and including, not only including people of color who have experienced poverty, but have them lead the way. And so in that, um, Vein. We're, we're holding these six statewide community forums beginning early next year on each of the policy areas that we identified in the report, the, the chapters around housing, health, hunger, and mental health, criminal justice, economic justice, legal and civil protections, and children and youth. Um, and so we'll have one on each of those topic areas um, to bring people into the conversation, um, you know, to work with um, members of APN, partners, um, people who and organizations who participated in the development of this report, but also really expand um, our reach and, and bring in stakeholders who haven't been part of the conversation as well. Um, and then lastly, work with state leaders, our legislators, stakeholders, like I said, on implementing the recommendations from the report. Um, and so to, to that end, um, we certainly have a little bit of um, support already. We've, we've been talking with the gubernatorial candidates. They all have a copy of the report. Um, and 
Senator, I'm sorry, um, Ambassador Phil Murphy had sent Assemblywoman Liz Moyo to the release event on the 19th to attend, um, and Seth Copperdale, the Green Party candidate, came as well, um, and they both actually signed our Poverty Solutions Pledge from APN earlier this year that we um, gave to all the gubernatorial candidates, and on that pledge, was one of the main overarching recommendations, the five, um, of reinstating the Office of the Public Advocate. So both Phil Murphy and Seth Copperdale have pledged that if they were elected, they would reinstitute that office. Um, and certainly we've, we've already been talking with other legislators on um, legislation that would strengthen the division of civil rights, which is that fifth recommendation, the overarching recommendation. Um, so that's it. We can open it for Great. Thank you. I know, Craig, you've got some questions via chat. Yeah, the first one was that uh, structural racism isn't a new problem in New Jersey. So what was the spark that made it a priority issue either now or back in 2015 when you started the process? Does someone who was involved in the early part of the process, not me, <laughs> want to answer that? Bruce, do you want to speak? Or you want me to speak? I think you, Natasha, because you were on the call. Uh, sorry, I was on <laughs> mute. I, I was going to say something too. Um, but do you want to talk first, Natasha? You can go ahead. Okay. I'll speak. But um, you can speak too. Okay. Um, I think that this, there was a lot going on that year, <laughs> um, and there were a lot of things in the news that were really bringing uh, the issues of communities that were being left behind and being actually kind of terrorized, uh, communities of color particularly terrorized um, on a frequent basis. And when I think as Renee said earlier, you know, we took the, the step uh, last year to make uh, tackling structural, structural racism a stated priority of this organization. Uh, and in 2015 was when that conversation really began because if we're talking about poverty, uh, you cannot divorce poverty from race. Um, and I think there's a lot of frustration with the way that poverty is discussed in this country and racism is discussed in this country um, and just, you know, making it an economics issue. And, um, you know, there's a lot, obviously a lot of parts where racism and economics and class, you know, economic class overlap, but there's a lot of really important parts where they don't. And, you know, really being quite honest with, you know, why certain policies have been uh, implemented, why certain laws were created, uh, and what effect that has is really vital to undoing a lot of the pain and a lot of the danger that happens to a lot of our citizens and our residents, rather, uh, on a daily basis. Um, yeah. So it was just recognizing that we hadn't officially in, you know, in pen and paper said that this was something we cared about Put and we needed to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Craig, you had another question? Yeah. Uh, in the interest of time, they were asking uh, to pick the top three recommendations to prioritize, but let's just talk about the, the easiest low-hanging fruit. Um, the, the one policy recommendation that you would prioritize either by urgency or doability, uh, which one would you choose? Um, and they were asking to answer in general and or for funders. Hmm. So I think there are, there are several things that we've already mentioned. Certainly I, I just mentioned um, that we have interest in reinstating the public advocate and the strengthening the division of civil rights. Um, both Bruce and uh, Brandon, I believe, mentioned the um, criminal justice, the first criminal justice recommendation of um, requiring uh, racial and ethnic impact statements for um, criminal justice legislation. And that's all already gone through the legislature. The governor conditionally vetoed it, but most advocates see that as um, what he added was actually strengthening the bill. And we just heard today that that bill will be heard again by the Senate on Thursday. And then it just needs to be heard by the assembly to be adopted into law. So certainly there are lots of advocates who've worked on on that bill as well um, to get it through. And then the um, what Bruce mentioned in terms of the TANF 
benefit level being increased after 30 years and the elimination of the family cap, we've gotten those two pieces of legislation passed through the legislature in 2016 within four months after the legislators learned about the issues and within a month this year before the budget. Um, and unfortunately, both times they were vetoed by the governor, but certainly we've seen great bipartisan support on either side for those, those issues. But my, my initial answer was going to be that really the prioritization will happen when we bring in more stakeholders through those committee forums next year as well. Hmm. Great. Uh, any other questions that have come in? Any burning questions from folks who maybe didn't type it in? But I'm I'm just so conscious of the time, and we're we're now at at four o'clock. Um, I, we, we've recorded this so that it will be available on our website. As we said, there's a link to the report. The, uh, our presenters' bios are there as well. Um, Renee's contact information. I know I just want to give a shout out because I know that the Fund for New Jersey was one of the funders of this work. Um, and um, and I'm, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Kiki, and I also want to thank Irene um, Cooper-Bosch from the Victoria Foundation, who was the one who initially connected, uh, connected me with Renee. Um, I am so grateful to all of you for taking the time for the work that's gone into this, um, for keeping us in the loop, and, um, and ask that you keep us in the loop going forward and posted on, on what you're doing. Know that we have members who are very interested in this. Um, if there is additional information that, that comes out, uh, please go ahead and forward it, and we can, we can push it out to our members. Um, we do have a, an, um, a listserv that's focused specifically for funders interested in racial equity. So that's a, a means for us to get information out to those that are, are working on this. Um, I, if we were in person, I would say let's have a round of applause and um, just our heartfelt thanks for all the time and effort and energy and, and for joining us. This was really a wonderful, really, really um, substantive uh, discussion, and the report is extraordinary uh, in, in what it outlined. So thank you all very, very much. Um, if you haven't signed up for our um, uh, programming that's coming up, uh, we, the dinner conversations are now available for registration on our website. And um, we have our exhibition opening on uh, Thursday, a week from Thursday up at Al Jaira on the exhibit The Missing, uh, which you can learn more about on our website. And of course, we've got our Power Play, Slaying the Elephant in the Room, which gets at the uh, power dynamic between grantees and funders uh, all coming up in the next few weeks. So with that, I'll say thank you again to to uh, our presenters, Renee and Natasha and Bruce and Brandon, and, um, and just congratulate you on great work at the Anti-Poverty Network. Thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.